Right. Thank you, James, for this very interesting talk. Um, I, I'd, I need your help. I need you to tell me if you can see my slides. Yeah. You, yes, I can see it. It seems like they can. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to a talk from Yunus and I about PC projects uh, that we've been working on alongside Ollie Worthington uh, called Cuisine de Monde, the recipe recipeography machine. Um, uh, we're just entering our second year of the UGI program. Um, so, yeah, the idea for the project came from a combination of inspirations, really, uh, shown here. We wanted to combine a world map generator similar to Asgard's fantasy map generator with the interesting kind of thoughts put forward in this tweet that um, Yunus found about including food more in tabletop roleplay games. The idea that food is integral to discussions about culture was interesting to us, and we, we thought there was potential to marry this into a PCG project um, that generates recipes based on a generated world with different uh, countries. Uh, we were also inspired by a talk that we'd watched on uh, YouTube that was recorded at the Game Developer Conference in 2019, where Brian Buckley and Jason Grimblatt discuss the process by which they were able to go from abstract ideas about the world they wanted to create for the game Caves of Cod to the more concrete realizations of those ideas in the game space, or as they put it, go from abstract peak down to concrete valley. Um, so similar to the method discussed in the GDC talk and also to the system used for the game Ultima Ratio Regum, we wanted to create a generator that was a pipeline of generators, um, a multi-layered PCG system where the layers are kind of intertwined that mirrored this process of de-abstraction. Um, this is a high level overview of the generator as it stands at the moment. And uh, Yunus is gonna take you through this in a bit more detail in the next slides. Yeah, thank you, Amy. So I'm going to give you a small tour of the generators we use in the project and what the very ultimate goal is. So the whole idea is to generate at the end a kind of interactive cookbook, but not start from recipes themselves, but start from the world where they were birthed. So in, the, in blue, you can see that we'll start by creating first the, the, the plant that inhabits this world, its, this, its geography, and the name of its countries, and we slightly get uh, down to the, to the right when it gets writer, uh, up to recipes and country borders to create this kind of interactive cookbook. So let's see how these small generators work in, in, inside. So the first one, the very first one, is a terrain generator whose goal is to create the kind of wall map uh, of this fictional world. Uh, we start with a basic plane noise. We apply some custom sail automata rules to get a kind of um, earth-looking atlas. And on this map, you can see that there's some kind of different terrains, like at the top and the bottom, you, you have ice near the poles, and in the middle, you have kind of deserts near the equator. After that, we kind of place some population groups, and each one have a color, and we simulate the spread on this earth up until they have, they have colonized uh, land uh, of color, which we'll associate as countries right after. The next step is to give a name to these countries. Uh, what we did is that we took a list of existing cuisine styles, like for example, Japanese cuisine, and we, we used a list of Japanese dish names. We built a Markov chain from that, and we used that to generate plausible names for a country that features Japanese style cuisine. For instance, Tuyokawaga for uh, a country that could feature Japanese style cuisine, a fictional one. The next step is to create the plants that will inhabit this world. So the process is very simple. We take two existing plants, we combine them, we associate it to a gerund type, and we choose its edible parts. Here's an, an, an especially example. Uh, let's, let's say we took a strawberry and a courgette, we mix them to get a straw jet, uh, and we say, hey, this thing grows in the mountains, and its leaves and stem are edible. Now that we have our ingredients, what we do is that we, we're going to generate each fictional country signature dish. Um, to do that, so we look at the terrain, the terrain types it has uh, in its borders, for instance, I don't know, deserts and forests, and we look up at the available ingredients that grow in, this, in these terrains. Then we select a recipe template from the handmade templates that we've made, and we fill the templates with the fictional ingredients. Amy will give you a, fine, a small overview of what it looks like at the end. Yeah, so I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about the UI um, and also an example of a generated world 
and some of the recipes generated for the different regions of that world. Um, so the first thing you see is some instructions. Um, and the idea is that the player uses the binoculars as the cursor to hover over the different land masses as if exploring. Um, this uh, GIF is a little demo of the generator. As you see, the user moves a cursor over the different regions on the map and the, the areas light up, and the recipes for that country will appear in the yellow box on the right-hand side. Um, here you can see um, the prep time, the cooking time for the recipes, the ingredients list, and the amount of ingredients required, and also the instructions for how to cook the recipe. And if the user clicks on one of the countries, it locks the recipe in, so you can then take a closer look at it. Um, the user can hover over the individual ingredients um, in the recipe for some more information about each of them. All right, um, I'm now going to tell you about how we kind of played with the outputs of the system and its public reception. So one of the first thing I wanted to try is to try to actually cook a recipe from this fictional world into ours. So what we did is that we generated a fictional world and we pick up one of the countries, for example, here we have Nageida, a country in the north of this world, and we tried to cook its signature dish, the Nagayi's general soup. So we can see the list of fictional ingredients uh, that we don't actually have in our world, but because they are made up of mashups from the ones we actually have, I tried to use these ones. So for instance, um, the recipe tell, tells us to use espamatoes, which is a mix-up between asparagus and tomatoes, uh, mingets, which is a mix between minf and courgettes, and olean, which is conservatively a mix between orange and dandelion, and not olive and onion, has all the comments would say. Um, I'll try to, to follow the instructions to boil these ingredients and to, to blend them and to add a touch of olean cream. I tried at least. So this is what the end results look like. Um, a kind of soup uh, with a base of tomatoes and courgettes, some chunks of asparagus, some mint leaves, and in the middle, uh, a bunch of uh, orange cream and a small leaf of the dandelion. Um, what's the verdict? Well, surprisingly, it wasn't that bad. Like it was actually edible. And it, there was some kind of surprising taste in there. Like the asparagus is the either a good uh, uh, um, side of chunky bits that are very satisfying to chew. And also because the original soup for tomato and courgettes is very sour, the fact that you can it's a bit of, of uh, sweet cream, creates a kind of sweet and sour uh, taste, but in a soup, which I never tasted before. I found this was a very cool way to practice my cooking skills. Like I had to, to interpret the instructions and discover how to cook new ingredients, like how do you cook asparagus and how do you make an orange cream? And this leads me to one of the coolest things about this, this experiment is that it gave me practical knowledge about my, the outputs of my generator. Like, for instance, this recipe is not practical at all. Uh, it, it, you have to use way too many pots and pans to actually cook it. And there's a huge asymmetry in the task needed to make it. Like the, the orange cream is like sold as a kind of topping, but it took me the longest time to make. <laughs> it, and at the end, you know, take 25 minutes at all, as the template said. And that, that's kind of knowledge I couldn't have without actually cooking the recipe. What's cool is that we also had a bunch of positive product reception from actually trying this experiment. Um, and I tried to, to categorize them into three, three uh, different types. The first one is a call people who try to interpret this world with us, who use the information in the recipes to, imagi to imagine sorry, the, the lore behind this fictional world. For instance, you have Lana Snapayan who suggested that possibly this soup should be self-called because um, it's, it's supposed to be eaten in the jungle. And also possibly the mint would have been added into the, the, the soup because mint can ward off mosquitoes and there's a lot of mosquitoes in the jungle. This was very interesting to, to consider. We also got people who were inspired and who wanted to cook with us recipes from the same generators or possibly create their own and cook their own recipes. We also found that this project was a very good way to engage people with PCG and to involve them in this discussion. Um, even with people who don't know anything about PCG or software, um, like my own mother. And um, because we all have to, to eat at the end of the day, we all have experience with cooking. And it says has a good discussion point. And she even gave me some 
cool insight on how to eat. Um, she gave me a suggestion that possibly we could sort ingredients into categories so I can finally have well-balanced meals. Thanks, mom. Um, this was a cool way to discuss the challenges and the creativity needed in, in PCG. Here are some of our reflections at the end of this project. So what we try is to, is to create fictional cooking recipes uh, in a multi-layered manner where we cre first create the world and then after we get the recipes. And this led to cold to call stuff. Like we had some emerging phenomena where countries uh, that are neighbors might have the same terrains and therefore might have variations of the same recipe. Just like for instance, um, Morocco and Algeria always fight off to, to for their own variation of, of couscous, like which one is the best. It's, it's, it's a true thing. And bridging the world first is a way to, to get this kind of emergent phenomenon. It's also based on the, the topic of this project, it's also a cool way to, to try some stuff at home and get some, some insight onto how to make the generator better. And one of my last points on what was cool about it is that trying to actually understand a world from its, its recipes um, is a step toward a thing that we call generative archaeology games. And Dr. Michael Cook and their student Florence Nichols um, are trying to, to, to work into this area and to create a theory around it. And but this idea is very interesting to understand a whole fictional world that is not present on screen, but you can recreate based on small hints. Um, but now for the limitations of this project. Um, we felt, because it was a very simple project that we did in just one week, that there was a huge need of variety in the templates and the contents of, uh, of a generator. Like, for instance, you have very easily a lot of jungle soups. And it's very hard to balance. Like, if you want to get rid of the jungle soups, because it's multi-layered, you don't know which parameter you have to tweak. Like, contrary you might have to, to rise the level of the ocean so there's less jungle, and then at the end of the day, there's less jungle soups. But it's very hard to know which one of which parameter will will get to to which end. Um, we also believe that this project can be very cool for people who will, who work in world building and who wants to to get um, more help to build the lore of their own universes. We also thought that this system could be used to practice playful cooking, and help people cook in a playful manner, and possibly lead to new culinary discoveries. And I don't know one day add the nagatical soup into an actual cookbook. I'll, I'll leave hunting. Thanks, Ines. Um, yeah, to round up, I'll uh, say a bit about what plans we have for this uh, project moving forward. Um, we'd like to make more templates for different kinds of recipes. Um, at the moment, we have smoothie, soup, and stew. <laughs> um, and also make the templates more flexible in terms of what parts of them can be swapped out with other things to create like a greater sense of nuance in, in the recipes. We'd also like to create a more sensible system for attributing where plants grow to the type of plant. So, for example, you wouldn't want to find a juicy tomato-like plant labeled as growing in a desert biome, for example. In addition to this, we're interested in finding ways to integrate more cultural influence into the recipes. Um, this could maybe be achieved through the process of generating the recipe names or by creating a small history behind the recipes. Similar to how in real life, the sandwich was named after its creator, the Earl of Sandwich. Um, and as we save all the generated output anyway, we've discussed auto-populating a fictional world wiki, which would essentially be a PCG cookbook um, with some bits of history, possibly generated by GPT-3. Lastly, we'd love to see what others could bring to this idea. So we'd like to make the project open source and easy to hack uh, with the hope that a small community might form around the project. Uh, so that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you for listening. We hope that you've enjoyed hearing about our recipeography machine. Um, we welcome any questions you might have and our Twitter handles are at the bottom of the slide here.